Well, hello there. May the 4th be with you today. Check, check this out. Huh? For all you Star Wars fans, today's May 4th. And so we say, may the 4th be with you. Sounds kind of silly, doesn't it? But we enjoy it. It's kind of fun. Brings us into something, though, about that movie that has kind of captured the imagination over a number of years about the force that is with you. <clears throat> that there's some kind of an unseen, unplanned force out there, and it's not God. And that's what I want to talk about today, and for the rest of the week. We're going to look at some great hymns. One of the things about great hymns is the message within the songs. One of my pet peeves has been for a long time, back when I was a teenager probably, we sang a lot of the old hymns. That's all we sang. But they didn't mean much except at an emotional kind of level. And the songs were not written for emotional, but they were written for doctrine and theology and to teach us that God is a personal, loving being. Not a force, but a forceful personality. So I'd like to start off this week we're just going to use this as kind of some devotional things. Don't think it'll be quite as long. Don't plan it to be as long as I have been. But I want us to look at some of the verses in some of the great hymns, the ones that I enjoy, and hopefully you'll enjoy as well. And I want to start off this week with one that <clears throat> we used yesterday in our uh, worship time. Come thou fount of every, every blessing. I did a little background study. I looked on, online where all knowledge is, right? And uh, found out that the uh, author's name is Robert Robinson. It was written in 1755, so it was a long time ago, and before I was born. And um, Robinson had a rough background. He, uh, his mother was from a fairly wealthy and well-to-do family, but she married someone who was not in the that class. And unfortunately, when... Robert was a young man of about five or six. His father died. And is basically his grandfather, who had all the money, because he didn't like the marriage in the first place, disinherited his, his uh, daughter and only gave him a, just a little bit as, a, as kind of an allowance, not much at all. He went to uh, study to be a barber. He was just going to be a just a blue-collar worker. Getting by was not going to be easy. And he went one night, as was so often, he went to a, uh, an evangelistic meeting by George Whitfield. And George Whitfield was the great evangelist of that time. He was one of the uh, reasons for the Great Awakening. And he went to the uh, meeting and was, came under conviction and uh, was gloriously saved, became a Baptist first, and then a Methodist preacher. And he, he was very successful as far as numbers goes. He had a, a congregation as much of a, as a thousand people. Well, let me stop there. I'll, I'll end with the end of his story, which is not as glorious as his beginning of his story, but a, an interesting note for us, no pun intended, note for us to kind of take uh, to heart. So let's look, see if I can get this up here so I can... Look at the words and not miss them. When you look at these great old songs, they are, many of them are rather, um, very poetic, as this one is. Now I've lost the words, and I don't have them in front of me. Come on, guy, let's, let's try this again. There it goes. Very poetic, and so sometimes we lose the meaning of them. We don't really think them through. Because that poetic, and especially from a different time period, we don't connect with them. So that's my objective today, is to explain some of these verses. So it starts out, <clears throat> Come thou fount of every blessing. Why a fount? Because Jesus is the living water. Remember the woman at the well. Why is that significant? Well, significant in the fact that you've got to get water to live. And like with the woman at the well, that well was a fixed amount of water. In fact, it usually was 
rainwater that would come within season and be stored in a well. But if there was no water to be, if it were dry season, the well dried up. And that well contained a lot of pollution. Listen, there's a lot of pollution in our lives. And we try to pick out the things that we think are wrong instead of going and making sure that the fountain is where we get our life. And so he says, Come thou fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy praise. And I think of that as like an orchestral uh, instrument where they all tune to the same frequency, 440A, so that everyone is in tune. And the only time we're in tune is when we are in tune with Jesus Christ. Streams of mercy never ceasing. There it is. There's the fountain. Call for songs of loudest praise. That's what we do in, re in response. Teach me. Because we don't have it innately. We have to be taught the songs of grace. Because in our nature, in our natural existence, we don't have it. We have to be taught by the Spirit. Teach me some melodious sonnet. Some beautiful, me melody-enriched enriched sonnet. What's a sonnet? It is a poem. Teach me some melodious sonnet sung by flaming tongues above. Where's, where's the flaming tongues? Well, that's Acts chapter 2, when the Spirit descended upon the people of God as flames of tongues of flaming fire. Flaming tongues. And so he says, I want that Holy Spirit feeling. Don't you? Praise the mound, I'm fixed upon it. Fixed means I'm established upon it. Mount of thy redeeming love. That's the mountain. The mountain of your redeeming love. And I am fixed. I am settled. I am on a place where I can build my life. Remember the wise man and the foolish man? Built his house upon a what? A rock. And that's what he says. I am building upon the rock. Then he says in verse 2 is his own personal testimony. I was lost in utter darkness. Sounds like John Newton. I was blind, but now I see. There is a blindness that we have, and sin blinds us to the love and mercy of God. He says, I was lost in utter darkness till you came and rescued me. It wasn't my intellect. It wasn't my goodness. It was your mercy that came and sought me out. I was bound. I was in chains by all sin, all my sin, when your love came and Put the key in and set me free. What's the result? Now my soul can sing a new song, a song that I didn't know until you taught me. Now my heart has found a home. Why? Now your grace is always with me, with me and I'll never be alone. Those are great words. Man, isn't that a great thought that you are not alone, you are not by yourself, you're bought with a price, you've been sought out by God, and He loves you. You once were blind, but now you see, and you were once bound in sin, but now you are set free. Then I love this verse. We'll close with this. Oh, to grace, how great a debtor. Do you realize how much you're in debt? Do you remember the woman who put the ointment on the feet of Jesus? And do you remember Simon the leper who didn't catch it? And Jesus said, which one has experienced love the most and who which, which one will love more? He said, the one who has been forgiven more will love more. And he says, that's right. And here he says, the author of this great old hymn is saying, to grace, I am such a debtor. How much of a debtor? Daily, I'm constrained to be. What does constrained mean? It means I am bound. I am, I am tied up. What are you tied up to? Sin? No. Tied up to grace. And my life is so, is so enriched by grace, it is like I don't want to be let free. Let thy goodness like a fetter bind my wandering heart to thee. You know what a fetter is? A fetter are, it, it's locks and chains. When someone is fettered, they are a prisoner. And he says, let your goodness be the lock and chain of my life. And may you bind my wandering heart to you. 
Jesus or Paul says the same thing. Love constrains us. It changes us. It motivates us to be different kinds of people. But then he says this, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. Isn't that true? Don't you feel it? In these pandemic times, you're feeling good and you're feeling lousy. There is a proneness in our lives to wander away from God. Paul writes an entire chapter in Romans chapter 7 where he says, the things I want to do, I don't do. The things that I should do, I don't. And it's just, this is a fight that I fight every day of my life. I have a proneness in my nature to go away on my own. And I, and the first step to combat that is to recognize that. And then he says, that proneness to leave the God I love, what are we going to do? Here is my heart, Lord. Take, seal it, seal it. What? For thy courts above. You take it. You change it. You transform me. You motivate me to be the kind of person that I should be. Now, told you I'd come back and give you the rest of the story. And it's an interesting but somewhat sad ending. So I told you that Robin, Robert Robinson, he wrote this song in 1722, I believe it is, is right about the time of his conversion, okay? Became a very well-known pastor. And uh, on one occasion, unfortunately, for some unexplained reason, he became depressed, discouraged, and lost his congregation, lost his ministry. He became very monotonous in his life. And on a monotonous stagecoach trip one time, he was sitting there and there was a woman who started to sing to break the monotony. And she sang, Come thou fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace. And went on and sang the entire song by heart. And as, I'll just read this, as she finished singing, the young woman asked Roberts what he thought about the song. His startling re reply was, Madam, I am, I am the unhappy man who wrote that hymn many years ago. And I would give a thousand worlds if I had them, if I could feel them now as I felt then. You see, there is a proneness even in his life to leave the God he loves. Psalm 37, 4, Delight thyself in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of your heart. Well, that's my word for you today as we look at this great old hymn. Have a great rest of the day.